If you're just learning to cook and the thought of entertaining has you in a panic, not to worry, today's episode is for you. I really think a brunch is a great way to get your feet wet entertaining because the recipes are easier and they're usually less expensive too. You don't have to worry about buying expensive meats, alcohol, even dessert. It's basically just eggs and baked goods. I also love to throw a brunch in the summertime because it allows me to entertain when the day is cooler and before it gets too hot. So here's what's on tap for today's menu. We're gonna kick things off with two types of drinks, a self-serve juice bar and an exotic iced coffee. Then I'll show you how to make my delicious apricot ginger scones. And the best part is they can be made the night before. I'll show you how to make a delicious yogurt parfait with a homemade granola. It's easier than you think. And for the main course, one of my favorite brunch items, a puffy egg baked casserole that's as light as a souffle. I'll show you how to make some easy side dishes like crispy oven roasted potatoes and broiled tomatoes with fresh thyme. And to round out the meal, a fresh peach fruit salad with fresh mozzarella, prosciutto, and mint. It's an awesome menu that I promise your guests are gonna love. In fact, I made this very same menu for my sister's baby shower a few years ago, and it was terrific because we had 25 people, but you can make most of the items the day before, and the day of, the dishes are so easy that it comes together very quickly. It was a huge hit. a self-serve drink bar. I think it's really interactive for guests, it's a great conversation starter, and it allows guests to kind of help themselves while you're busy in the kitchen getting the meal ready. To create a self-serve juice bar, it couldn't be easier. Pick six of your favorite juices. For me, I love to go with orange juice, grapefruit juice, cranberry juice, pineapple juice, mango nectar, and papaya nectar. I know that sounds like a lot of juices and you really don't even need to use six. You could pick four or three, but the idea is that guests will serve themselves and kind of make their own juice blends. So maybe they put a little bit of orange juice with a splash of cranberry juice and a topping of pineapple juice. It's just fun to see what your guests come up with and the guests start to kind of talk with each other and want to taste each other's drinks and it just becomes kind of a fun interactive drink. Pick a pretty carafe to put your juice in. I really love those fancy French lemonade bottles that you can find at better grocery stores. I buy the lemonade and then I save the bottle because then it provides me with these carafes that I can use for self-serve juice bars or water for the table. I also love that they have these great little tops to them so you can store juice in it, pop it in the fridge, and it's not gonna spill over on you. So what I will do is I will set out tall glasses and then just to be festive, I love to have those little paper straws already waiting. These straws seem to be everywhere nowadays, but I really love them. They're inexpensive for a big box, and they just kind of give a little extra pizzazz to your party. For a brunch, I love to serve coffee, but sometimes in the summertime, it can just be a little too hot to serve hot coffee. So I love to serve iced coffee and give it an exotic twist. So the first step is to brew your coffee. If you don't have a coffee maker, I really recommend buying a French press. What's great about it is it doesn't need to be plugged in, so it's not gonna take any extra counter space. They're fairly inexpensive and they last forever. In my opinion, the perfect measurement for the perfect cup of coffee is one tablespoon of ground French roast to one cup of water. So a French press will usually hold about eight cups. So you may wanna double that. You may wanna make two pots of it. Then pour it in a heat safe carafe, pop it in the fridge overnight, and then the morning of the brunch, you'll be all ready to go with a perfect blend of iced coffee. And just to make it a little bit different, I set out a carafe of coconut milk. To the iced coffee, guests will add a little splash of coconut milk and then a little sprinkling of cardamom. If you're not familiar with it, it's a very perfumey, exotic spice. The guests are just gonna sprinkle on top. When they take a sip of this coffee, not only is it gonna be cool and refreshing, but with the coconut milk and the spiciness of the cardamom, it's gonna kind of transport them to someplace else. There's no better way to welcome your guests than with some delicious baked good fresh from the oven. And I really love to make scones. Scones are one of those things that people see and get kind of intimidated by, so there's a great wow factor when people arrive and they see homemade scones. But the secret is they couldn't be easier to make. I love this recipe because you don't need any fancy kitchen equipment. The only two things you need are your hands. So in a bowl, you're gonna combine flour, sugar, salt, and baking powder, and give that just a light whisk. To that add really cold butter. So it's important that the butter is very, very cold because that's what's gonna make your scone extra flaky. Put the butter in and then start to just kind of mush it together with the flour. 
You really just want to kind of incorporate all of that butter with the flour until kind of a coarse meal develops. Then you're going to take dried apricots and you're going to dice them small. Basically just cut the apricot in half and then cut maybe six pieces out of that. Toss that in. Then you want to get crystallized candy ginger. Ginger can be a little bit strong, so you really want to cut that ginger very, very small into diced pieces. Apricot and ginger is such a great combination. They're natural flavor friends, so to speak, and they really go well in something like a scone. Take two eggs and mix it with about a half a cup of heavy cream. Keep adding the mixture until the scones come together in a dough. In my opinion, it's always better to have dough that's a little bit too wet than too dry. Because if your dough is too dry, it really won't come together well, and when you cut into it to bake the scones, they'll all kind of fall apart. Once your dough is nice and sort of sticky and everything is well incorporated, add just a little bit of flour on top so that it's easy to handle. At this point, you may even want to wash your hands, dry them, and add flour to your hands. Turn the dough out on a floured surface and just kind of keep mushing it together until kind of a square forms. The idea is to create a probably half inch thick mass of dough in the form of a square. And one of the ways that you can kind of help that along is with a kitchen knife. Just kind of pressing it up against the sides, turning the dough around until you have a nice square. Once you have your square form, wrap that dough in plastic wrap tightly and refrigerate for at least 30 minutes. Personally, I feel it's best to refrigerate it overnight. To create your scones, you're gonna take your refrigerated dough, unwrap the plastic, and then reshape the dough just to make sure that it's a really great square. Once the dough has been refrigerated, it's even easier to mold. Cut that in half and then half again. So basically you have four equal squares. From that, take each square, cut down the diagonal to create two triangles. Transfer the triangles onto a parchment lined sheet pan. Brush those scones with a little heavy cream and raw sugar. The raw sugar is great because then when those scones are baked and have puffed and are golden brown, when guests bite into it, they get a nice little crunch on top from the sugar. So it's a really nice extra step if you have the time to do it. Take the scones and bake them at 400 degrees for about 15 minutes, just until they're nice and golden brown. Take them out of the oven, let them cool for just a few minutes, and then place them in a decorative basket. And watch your guests go nuts. In addition to the scones, I also like to have a healthy alternative. Sometimes people are kind of on special diets or they don't necessarily want to dive into a fresh baked good. So I always think it's nice to have an alternative for them as well. And I couldn't think of a better thing than my homemade granola with yogurt and fresh fruit. Granola can be expensive. Sometimes you see those little packages that are like this and they're six or seven dollars. And for something like this where you're serving eight people, that could really add up. So I love to make my own granola and it's so much easier than you may think, trust me. In a bowl, you're gonna combine one egg white, a quarter cup of honey, and a tablespoon of brown sugar. Whisk that all together. Add two cups of quick cooking oats, and then a cup of your favorite nuts. I really like a half a cup of raw cashews and a half a cup of raw pecans. I think that's a really great combination. And you wanna look for nuts that say raw. You don't want them salted or already roasted. You want them in their purest state because you're gonna be adding sweet things to them, you're gonna be roasting them, so you really don't wanna kinda of double roast it. So look for the raw nuts. Once that's all combined, turn that out onto a rimmed baking sheet. So it's kind of like a single layer. Bake that at 350 for about 10 minutes. Now you really have to keep an eye on it because granola can burn really quickly. And there's been many times that I have been multitasking and have burnt the granola. So just keep an eye on it and make sure that as soon as it starts to turn kind of golden brown and you'll smell it, that's when it's done. So once it's done, toss in your raisins and your dried coconut flakes. You wanna keep those to the end because you really want them to retain as much flavor as possible. And if you roasted it with the granola, they get kind of dried out and hard on you, so it's better to kind of toss them even when the granola's warm. That will help release some of their flavors as well. As the granola cools, it's gonna dry and crisp up on you. Once it reaches that level of crispness that you like, then it's time to transfer it into an airtight container or Ziploc bag, and you're good to go. I really love this granola because it can be made the day before. So all you have to do the morning of the party is assemble it. 
take a pretty decorative glass bowl. You put down a layer of yogurt, then you put a layer of granola, top with a little bit more yogurt, and another layer of granola, and then top with fresh berries. I really like the mixture of blueberries, blackberries, and raspberries because all these fruits right now are at their peak and it really prevents having to chop or prep any other types of fruit that you may need to actually cut and prep. All you have to do is clean them and toss them on top. I have made this recipe for probably about 10 years, and every time I do it, people go nuts for this thing. It is delicious, it's inexpensive, and it just has kind of a sophisticated taste to it because it feels almost like a souffle, but without the work of a souffle. So here's what you do. You're gonna combine 12 eggs in a bowl. I know, 12 eggs does sound like a lot, but keep in mind, this serves eight, so everybody's getting about one egg and a half, so it's not as if you're ingesting all 12 eggs. Then you're gonna add two cups of cottage cheese. That's sort of the secret ingredient. I know that sounds like kind of a weird combination, but the cottage cheese is what's gonna give it its lift and make it feel almost more like a souffle. Add the flour, baking soda, and melted butter. And then, I know, here it comes, four cups of cheese. Again, I know it's a lot of cheese, it's party food, this isn't something you're gonna be eating every day, and everybody's just gonna probably have a little square of it. So it's actually not that bad. I really recommend finely shredded cheese. You can find those packs in the grocery store that say Mexican blend and it incorporates probably two or three different cheeses. That's a really great one to get. If you get cheese that's grated too thick, it ends up actually melting in big clumps in the casserole and is not evenly distributed. So the real secret tip is get the finely shredded cheese. You're gonna turn that out into a greased nine by 13 dish and bake at 350 for about 30 minutes, just until the casserole is lightly golden brown and slightly puffed. You'll know it's ready when you insert a knife into the center of it and it comes out clean. You can serve this with hot sauce or salsa, but I also like to really serve it with broiled tomatoes, and I'm gonna show you how to make them. I really love the combination of tomato and egg. They are natural flavor mates. Kind of like if you think about it when you have scrambled eggs and you want to put some hot sauce on it or some ketchup, it's kind of the same principle, but you're just using the natural tomato. So what you want to do is look for the Roma tomatoes. They're the smaller tomatoes that are kind of oval and oblong in nature. Slice those in half, put them on a rimmed cookie sheet, drizzle a little bit of olive oil, season with salt and pepper, and fresh thyme. You're gonna put those under the broiler. Now the broiler is just the hottest setting of your oven where the heating implement on the top is actually providing the heat. Set them under the broiler for about three to five minutes just until the tops are bubbling and the skins begin to break apart. When they're done, you can either serve them hot or you can set them aside and serve them at room temperature. That would be just as good. Now for the roasted potatoes. No breakfast is complete, in my opinion, without some great roasted potatoes. And I have perfected this recipe over the last couple of years. I could never get them crispy on the outside and creamy on the inside until I realized I had to increase the temperature of the oven. So you roast these at 450 degrees, which is a very, very hot oven. But there's two benefits. One, they roast up really quickly. And two, you get that crispy outside and creamy inside. So you wanna buy those baby red new potatoes and wash and dry them really well. Don't want any moisture in your potato. If the potatoes are too wet and you roast them at a high temperature, it's actually gonna kinda of steam the potatoes and you're not gonna get that crispy skin that you're looking for. So make sure they're really dry. Then toss them with olive oil, salt and pepper, and freshly chopped rosemary. Turn it out onto a rimmed cooking sheet and make sure your potatoes have room to breathe. You wanna make sure it's a really nice single layer. Again, if they're too crowded, they're gonna steam and not crisp up on you. You're gonna roast them at 450 degrees for about 25 to 30 minutes, just until they're nice and crispy and golden brown. Once the potatoes are done, they're ready to be served. Again, these can be served piping hot or at room temperature, whatever is easier for you. With the potatoes, you could serve just regular ketchup, or you could kick it up a notch and serve some smoky ketchup. It's a lot easier to make than you may think. All you do is get some store-bought ketchup that's at room temperature. Mix it together with some smoked paprika. 
Now smoked paprika and regular paprika are actually two different things. So when you go to the store, make sure the jar says smoked paprika. It's not spicy or hot, so it's not gonna give you any kind of kick. But what it is gonna do is impart a wonderful smoky flavor to the ketchup and just make your ketchup feel a little bit extra fancy. this meal, I think it's great to have some sort of fruit salad. But rather than the same old fruit salad of cantaloupe and grapes and maybe a few strawberries, I thought it would be more interesting to add a few different flavors. This is a twist on a caprese salad, which is traditionally tomato, mozzarella, and basil. But instead of the savory flavors of tomato and basil, we're gonna swap those out for some sweeter flavors because this is a brunch, and we're gonna use fresh peaches and fresh mint slice some fresh peaches just into wedges and set those aside. Then you're gonna go buy two containers of fresh mozzarella balls, the ones that come in the water. Those are the kinds you want. Drain out the water and just take the little mozzarella balls, usually the ones that are the bite size are the best, and put those in a bowl. Chop up some fresh mint. Toss the whole thing together, so you're gonna throw in your fresh peaches, the mozzarella, the fresh mint, toss it together, and then add your prosciutto. Now, prosciutto is a very salty cured meat. So the combination of the sweet peaches and the salty prosciutto and the kick of mint is a great flavor combination. But prosciutto is also sliced really thin and can kind of get kind of messy on you if you try to chop it. So don't even try to chop it. Just tear it roughly and toss it in the salad. Garnish with some fresh mint and you've got a refreshing fruit salad that has a little bit of a twist to it. Like I said at the top of the episode, the great thing about brunch is that you can get away without having to serve dessert. But if you feel like you really just kind of want something sweet to finish the meal, I'm gonna give you two options. Option number one would just be some freshly sliced watermelon drizzled with honey. Cut the watermelon before the guests arrive, and then right before serving, drizzle it with some honey. Or option two would be some fresh fruit sherbet served in a decorative glass with some shortbread cookies. That's another great alternative that's very summery and light and so easy to put together. So here's the game plan. Personally, I feel brunch is best served at around 11 a.m. That way, you have enough time in the early morning to get everything ready, and it's not so early that your guests are gonna grumble about having to get up to come to your house. But if you're gonna be entertaining at 11 o'clock in the morning, you've got to be organized. So here's the plan of attack. The day before, you're gonna make the scone dough, wrap it in plastic, and pop it in the fridge. Brew the coffee for the iced coffee and pop that in the fridge as well. Make the batter for the egg bake, cover and refrigerate, Make the granola, let it dry out, and store in an airtight container, and make the smoky ketchup. The day of, you wanna wake up at 8.30, shower, change, and get ready. That way, you're all set, and you can get the preparations underway. From nine o'clock to 10 o'clock, cut the scones and bake them. Prep the potatoes and store at room temperature in a Ziploc bag. Slice the tomatoes and drizzle them with oil, season, and keep covered at room temperature. From 10.30 to 11, you're gonna roast your potatoes. Set out your juice bar and coffee. Place the scones in a basket and assemble the parfait. When guests arrive, place the egg bake in the oven. That way, it can be baking while the guests are enjoying the drinks, the scones, and the parfait. 15 minutes before you're ready to eat, enlist a guest to help clear the plates from the scones and the parfait. Meanwhile, you can prep your peach salad. Then, take your tomatoes and put them under the broiler at the same time, take the potatoes and pop them back in the oven, but on the lower rung. That way, they'll just kind of crisp up and be warm and be ready to serve. And then sit down and enjoy a leisurely summertime brunch. So that's it. That's how you throw the perfect summer brunch. I hope all of you beginning cooks out there will give this menu a try. I promise, it's super simple. Your guests are gonna love it. And if you follow the game plan and all my tips, you're gonna pull it off like a seasoned pro. But leave me a comment and let me know how it goes. I wanna know how it went.